Book two, chapters ten and eleven of the Blue Lagoon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. The Blue Lagoon by H. De Vere Stackpole. Part two, chapter ten, an island honeymoon. One day, Dick climbed on to the tree above the house, and driving Madame Coco off the nest upon which she was sitting, peeped in. There were several pale green eggs in it. He did not disturb them, but climbed down again, and the bird resumed her seat as if nothing had happened. Such an occurrence would have terrified a bird used to the ways of men, but here the birds were so fearless and so full of confidence that often they would follow Emmeline in the wood, flying from branch to branch, peering at her through the leaves, lighting quite close to her once even on her shoulder. The days passed. Dick had lost his restlessness. His wish to wander had vanished. He had no reason to wander. Perhaps that was the reason why. In all the broad earth he could not have found anything more desirable than what he had. Instead now of finding a half-naked savage, followed dog-like by his mate, you would have found of an evening a pair of lovers wandering on the reef. They had, in a pathetic sort of way, attempted to adorn the house with a blue flowering creeper taken from the wood and trained over the entrance. Emmeline, up to this, had mostly done the cooking, such as it was. Dick helped her now, always. He talked to her no longer in short sentences, flung out as if to a dog, and she, almost losing the strange reserve that had clung to her from childhood, half showed him her mind. It was a curious mind, the mind of a dreamer, almost the mind of a poet. The chloricorns dwelt there, and vague shapes born of things she had heard about or dreamt of. She had thoughts about the sea and stars, the flowers and birds. Dick would listen to her as she talked, as a man might listen to the sound of a rivulet. His practical mind could take no share in the dreams of his other half, but her conversation pleased him. He would look at her for a long time together, absorbed in thought. He was admiring her. Her hair, blue-black and glossy, tangled him in its meshes. He would stroke it, so to speak, with his eyes and then pull her close to him and bury his face in it. The smell of it was intoxicating. He breathed her as one does the perfume of a rose. Her ears were small, like little white shells. He would take one between finger and thumb and play with it as if it were a toy, pulling at the lobe of it, or trying to flatten out the curved part. Her breasts, her shoulders, her knees, her little feet, every bit of her, he would examine and play with and kiss. She would lie down and let him, seeming absorbed in some far-away thought of which he was the object. Then, all at once, her arms would go round him. All this used to go on in the broad light of day, under the shadow of the artu leaves, with no one to watch except the bright-eyed birds in the leaves above. Not all their time would be spent in this fashion. Dick was just as keen after the fish. He dug up with a spade, improvised from one of the boards of the dinghy, a space of soft earth near the taro patch, and planted the seeds of melons he found in the wood. He rethatched the house. They were, in short, as busy as they could be in such a climate, but love-making would come upon them in fits and then everything would be forgotten. Just as one revisits some spot to renew the memory of a painful or pleasant experience received there, they would return to the valley of the idol and spend a whole afternoon in its shade. The absolute happiness of wandering through the woods together, discovering new flowers, getting lost and finding their way again, was a thing beyond expression. Dick had suddenly stumbled upon love. His courtship had lasted only some twenty minutes, 
It was being gone over again now, and extended. One day, hearing a curious noise from the tree above the house, he climbed it. The noise came from the nest, which had been temporarily left by the mother bird. It was a gasping, wheezing sound, and it came from four wide-open beaks, so anxious to be fed that one could almost see into the very crops of their owners. They were Coco's children. In another year each of those ugly, downy things would, if permitted to live, be a beautiful sapphire-coloured bird with a few dove-coloured tail-feathers, coral beak, and bright, intelligent eyes. A few days ago each of these things was imprisoned in a pale green egg. A month ago they were nowhere. Something hit Dick on the cheek. It was the mother-bird returned with food for the young ones. Dick drew his head aside, and she proceeded without more ado to fill their crops. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 The Vanishing of Emmeline Months passed away. Only one bird remained in the branches of the Artu. Coco's children and mate had vanished, but he remained. The breadfruit leaves had turned from green to pale gold and darkest amber, and now the new green leaves were being presented to the spring. Dick, who had a complete chart of the lagoon in his head, and knew all the soundings and best fishing places, the locality of the stinging coral, and the places where you could wade right across at low tide, Dick, one morning, was gathering his things together for a fishing expedition. The place he was going to lay some two and a half miles across the island, and as the road was bad he was going alone. Emmeline had been passing a new thread through the beads of the necklace she sometimes wore. This necklace had a history. In the shallows, not far away, Dick had found a bed of shellfish. Wading out at low tide, he had taken some of them out to examine. They were oysters. The first one he opened, so disgusting did its appearance seem to him, might have been the last, only that under the beard of the thing lay a pearl. It was about twice the size of a large pea, and so lustrous that even he could not but admire its beauty, though quite unconscious of its value. He flung the unopened oysters down, and took the thing to Emmeline. Next day, returning by chance to the same spot, he found the oysters he had cast down all dead and opened in the sun. He examined them, and found another pearl embedded in one of them. Then he collected nearly a bushel of the oysters, and left them to die and open. The idea had occurred to him of making a necklace for his companion. She had one made of shells. He intended to make her one of pearls. It took a long time, but it was something to do. He pierced them with a big needle, and at the end of four months or so the thing was complete. Great pearls most of them were, pure white, black, pink, some perfectly round, some tear-shaped, some irregular. The thing was worth perhaps fifteen or perhaps twenty thousand pounds, for he only used the biggest he could find, casting away the small ones as useless. Emmeline this morning had just finished restringing them on a double thread. She looked pale, and not at all well, and had been restless all night. As he went off, armed with his spear and fishing tackle, she waved her hand to him without getting up. Usually she followed him a bit into the wood when he was going away like this, but this morning she just sat at the doorway of the little house, the necklace in her lap, following him with her eyes, until he was lost amidst the trees. He had no compass to guide him, and he needed none. He knew the woods by heart. The mysterious line beyond which scarcely an artu tree was to be found the long strip of mammy apple, a regular sheet of it a hundred yards broad, and reaching from the middle of the island right down to the lagoon. The clearings, some almost circular, where the fern grew knee-deep. Then he came to the bad part. The vegetation here had burst into a riot, 
All sorts of great sappy stalks of unknown plants barred the way and tangled the foot, and there were boggy places into which one sank horribly. Pausing to wipe one's brow, the stalks and tendrils one had beaten down or beaten aside rose up and closed together, making one a prisoner almost as closely surrounded as a fly in amber. All the noontides that had ever fallen upon the island seemed to have left some of their heat behind them here. The air was damp and close, like the air of a laundry, and the mournful and perpetual buzz of insects filled the silence without destroying it. A hundred men with scythes might make a road through the place to-day. A month or two later, searching for the road, you would find none. The vegetation would have closed in as water closes when divided. This was the haunt of the jug orchid, a veritable jug, lid and all. Raising the lid you would find the jug half filled with water. Sometimes in the tangle up above, between two trees, you would see a thing like a bird come to ruin. Orchids grew here as in a hothouse. All the trees, the few there were, had a spectral and miserable appearance. They were half starved by the voluptuous growth of the gigantic weeds. If one had much imagination, one felt afraid in this place, for one felt not alone. At any moment it seemed that one might be touched on the elbow by a hand reaching out from the surrounding tangle. Even Dick felt this, unimaginative and fearless as he was. It took him nearly three-quarters of an hour to get through, and then, at last, came the blessed air of real day, and a glimpse of the lagoon between the tree-boles. He would have rowed round in the dinghy, only that, at low tide, the shallows of the north of the island were a bar to the boat's passage. Of course, he might have rowed all the way round by way of the strand and reef entrance, but that would have meant a circuit of six miles or more. When he came between the trees, down to the lagoon edge, it was about eleven o'clock in the morning, and the tide was nearly at the full. The lagoon just here was like a trough, and the reef was very near, scarcely a quarter of a mile from the shore. The water did not shelve, it went down sheer, fifty fathoms or more, and one could fish from the bank just as from a pierhead. He had brought some food with him, and he placed it under a tree whilst he prepared his line, which had a lump of coral for a sinker. He baited the hook, and, whirling the sinker round in the air, sent it flying about a hundred feet from the shore. There was a baby coconut tree growing just at the edge of the water. He fastened the edge of his line round the narrow stem, in case of eventualities, and then, holding the line itself, he fished. He had promised Emmeline to return before sundown. He was a fisherman, that is to say, a creature with the enduring patience of a cat, tireless and heedless of time as an oyster. He came here for sport more than for fish. Large things were to be found in this part of the lagoon. Last time he had hooked a horror in the form of a catfish. At least in Outward's appearance it was likest to a Mississippi catfish. Unlike the catfish, it was coarse and useless as food, but it gave good sport. The tide was now going out, and it was at the going out of the tide that the best fishing was to be had. There was no wind, and the lagoon lay like a sheet of glass, with just a dimple here and there where the outgoing tide made a swirl in the water. As he fished he thought of Emmeline and the little house under the trees. Scarcely one could call it thinking. Pictures passed before his mind's eye—pleasant and happy pictures, sunlit, moonlit, starlit. Three hours passed thus without a bite or symptom that the lagoon contained anything else but sea-water and disappointment. But he did not grumble. He was a fisherman. Then he left the line tied to the tree, and sat down to eat the food he had brought with him. He had scarcely finished his meal when the baby coconut tree shivered and became convulsed. 
and he did not require to touch the taut line to know that it was useless to attempt to cope with the thing at the end of it. The only course was to let it tug and drown itself, so he sat down and watched. After a few minutes the line slackened, and the little coconut tree resumed its attitude of pensive meditation and repose. He pulled the line up. There was nothing at the end of it but a hook. He did not grumble. He baited the hook again and flung it in, for it was quite likely that the ferocious thing in the water would bite again. Full of this idea, and heedless of time, he fished and waited. The sun was sinking into the west. He did not heed it. He had quite forgotten that he had promised Emmeline to return before sunset. It was nearly sunset now. Suddenly, just behind him, from among the trees, he heard a voice crying, Dick! End of chapter 11